Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you joined us today to stay curious. Today's program, we got a little bit of mix of space history that's going to emphasize this shuttle that's flying over Manhattan that actually ends up down here. And uh, that, of course, is Enterprise. So we're going to talk a little bit about Enterprise because it was on this date in space history that it came to Kenny Space Center the first time. And my co-producer, Marty Winkle, just took off our banner there so you can see it there. And take off my name on the bottom, Marty, and we're going to see where it exists right now over here at the Intrepid Museum on Manhattan there in the Hudson River. But quite a legacy of the shuttles that didn't make it to space. We're going to talk about a few of those. And we're glad that you're with us today because for over 20 years, the American Space Museum has been preserving the birth of America's space age right here in its delivery room, Brevard County, Florida. And we're glad that you support us. And it getting close to tax time. You can go up to our website, click on the donations, and we can fix you up with a tax donation to Uncle Sam to your favorite nonprofit, the American Space Museum in our U.S. Space Walk of Fame Foundation. So, hope everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, Easter is what we had. Extranaut. Everybody got a kick out of that Extranaut on there. And uh, uh, hope you all had a very safe time and uh, observed it in uh, any way you wanted there. And, of course, we're going to be promoting on... Stay curious, GoHistoryTravel.org made a very generous donation to the Stay Curious so that we can buy some equipment to bring you some remote programs uh, from location. Marty and I used to do that in the old days, and uh, they can, we need a laptop computer and a good uh, camera that has sound to it that we can plug in a microphone and thank you go travel go history travel.org i'll be featuring some of their items uh that they're posting on their blog as we go down the road here with stay curious and wanted to put up there also uh yes this beautiful shot of a rocket launch from our partners at the Hyatt Place Hotel, where we're going to be sponsoring, or they're going to be sponsoring, Shuttle Fest. And you can get a view like that from their fifth, view, fifth floor uh, launch viewing area there when you stay at this beautiful hotel right there on US-1 at the 405 Interchange. And 405 takes you into Kennedy Visitors Complex. Uh, Boeing happens to be beside them, too. So... Uh, thank you, Rob and Dana, for make, rolling out the red carpet for us this weekend for Shuttle Fest 2. You can hit the QR code there if you're coming and save you 5 bucks on the $20 admission. We're going to be featuring space artist Chris Callie. Hello, Chris. I got your box of goodies today at our museum. And uh, we have got three pa panels, and two of the panels are going to one of them's going to feature the movie documentary, The Base to Space. We're going to show that at 115. Mike Cotton is the director with all the principals involved there. We showed it in September. Uh, kind of a soft opening for it. And then we're going to have Shuttle Fest 2 morning panel. What's the legacy of the shuttle era with Nick Thomas, John Zarella, and Tom Usiak there? I know Tom's probably watching. Hello, Tom. Have a safe trip down to the Space Coast. We will have Tom on the show Thursday to talk about his experience as the photographer at Kazakhstan when Norm Thagard was launched to the uh, space station Mir in 1995. Uh, Tom's going to tell us about that experience and a little bit about what he's up to and, and what he thinks about the shuttle era. That's going to be our 10 a.m. panel. And then we're going to have an art panel, Space Art, The Past Reflects the Future, with Chris Callie, Ron Woods, and Doug Forrest there. Hello to you, Doug. He's probably watching on his lunch break in Los Angeles. So uh, Ron's local. Ron, uh, we've not talked about too much on Stay Curious. We're going to have him on a program here. He was a suit tech on Apollo 11, 8, and 15 putting those moon uh, moonbound astronauts in their spacesuits. He developed an affinity for drawing simple things like, like their glove or their helmet. 
uh, and you're going to love Ron's work when you see it. So uh, kind of a, uh, we want to have these two panels every year to look at uh, Shuttle Fest in the light of an artist as well as people, what they think about it. And finally, our auction is going to be the next auction, April 29th, Saturday, two weeks from Saturday, online only. We've got some amazing items in there. Uh, 51L crew law, uh, signed lithograph. We've got several, uh, Krista McAuliffe signed uh, postal cover. So uh, this helps support our museum and keep the doors open. So bid again, auctions and Chuck Jeffrey are handling it for us again, as they always have so expertly. Well, wanted to give a happy birthday shout out. Uh, and, oh gosh, Marty, I didn't print that out, or did I? No, uh, yes I did. Um, oh, I did. Shout out uh, to Hobalt here, John Hobalt. Uh, he is the, um, I didn't print out all about him, so let me, Try to pull off the top of my head. He was born uh, over 100 years ago in 1919, all right? And John Hobal is the man with the... Uh, Marty, I think it might be over there on my desk. Doggone it, I didn't print that out. Uh, he was born in Iowa, went to school in Illinois. Uh, nope, okay. And I, I had the quotes that Von Braun had about him because this is the man that changed our attitude about going uh, to um, to the moon direct directly with a big rocket that just go directly to the moon, land with that rocket. And uh, now nah, I, I don't have it, Marty. I just talk off the top of my head. Uh, I didn't print my notes out for him. I'm bad about that. Apologize for that. But John Hobal, born there. No, it's good. He created the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, where we would rendezvous uh, in lunar orbit with the spacecraft that we sent down. So you'd have a mothership, and this was his big deal. And we, we even honor John Hobalt changing the idea of Werner von Braun. And the panel next to President Kennedy there, just to the left of him or to the right as we're looking at him, uh, there at our Apollo gallery has a picture up in the upper left in this beautiful description of the Apollo process. That is John Hobal up there uh, lecturing about his lunar orbit rendezvous. So, uh, yeah, Marty. Are you okay? Oh, he's got the chair in the way there, maybe. Thank you. Uh, Episode 500, no, episode 791 for Marty and I today. And, and we've been very busy with Shuttle Fest, so excuse my faux pas here. But John Hobal, one of the behind-the-scenes guys of the Apollo uh, landings of the 1960s. And uh, when he approached NASA, he said he was kind of sheepish about him. But he, he says, if you want to get to the moon... This is the before 1969 ends. This is the way to do it, and there he is at his chalkboard. There, we we uh, recreated it up there in one of those beautiful bronze panels, and when we landed on the moon, uh, Werner von Braun invited him into the firing room on that July 16, 1969, when we launched Saturn V, and when it successfully launched, he turned to John. Hobal or sought him out and said, thank you for all that you've done. Uh, it was the right thing to do. Uh, I actually sent a letter to him, Von Braun did, after the moon landing. So one of the seminal behind-the-scenes people of the Apollo era, John Hobal, was born this day uh, in, uh, uh, I think, 1912, 1919, maybe. He's passed away, moved on, wanted to acknowledge him there. All right, Shuttles of April, 16 beautiful Shuttles of April. We've got Terry White coming on Wednesday to talk about a few of them as he was the manager of the orbital processing facilities. And this whole process of the shuttle era uh, uh, is, is just an amazing one. And it's got so many players in it uh, and a few uh Shuttles that didn't make it to space are big players in it. But you're looking at 
95 astronauts can say, I orbited the Earth in the month of May. I went out, Marty, and saw uh, Don Thomas on Easter Sunday out there at the Space Center and heard him talk again. Uh, he's a STS-83. Uh, we've heard four or five other astronauts that have been on these missions. But April has got the maiden flight of Columbia in the middle there, STS-1, and then STS-6 in the upper left, the maiden flight of Challenger. The Hubble telescope was deployed 33 years ago, April 24th there on STS-31. Bunch of hard hat missions to the International Space Station and a bunch of science. And we're going to have Mikey Haddad, payload manager, to come in and talk uh, a week from Wednesday on April 16th about uh, the reflight of STS-83, uh, a 16-day mission that after four days they brought it back because of a fuel cell problem. Then it went back to space just three months later with the identical crew. But on this date in history, going the wrong way, Peach Fuzz, there we go, is when Enterprise arrived at Cape uh, at Kennedy Space Center, called a uh, pathfinder, meaning a trailblazer in some NASA literature. But there was a mock-up orbiter called Pathfinder. Uh, and uh, that confused some people when I put it on as the Pathfinder instead of Trailblazer that I was referring to the Pathfinder orbiter. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about Enterprise. This is April 10th, 79, when it arrived, of course, on the back of a uh, Jumbo 747 jet named after the science fiction uh Star Trek series spaceship Enterprise. It was originally going to be called, uh, oh, uh, excuse, uh, what was it originally going to be called, Marty? I did on the tip of my tongue. It was going to be called, uh, the Trekkies lobbied for it to be called Enterprise as it was to be named Constitution. And unveiled on Constitution Day, September 17th. Well, fans of Star Trek asked, asked the U.S. President Gerald Ford through a letter-writing campaign to name the orbiter after the television show's fictional Starship Enterprise. And here it is as a mock-up, a very important uh, test fit module up there on pad 39A with the right white room attached to it. Um, the orbiter was used for ground vibration tests, allowing engineers to compare data from the actual flight vehicles. Then it was used a time and time again, Marty. And Enterprise is one of the most traveled of all the orbiters, all right? Uh, it was almost converted into a, a flight orbiter, uh, but uh, due, to, due to the changes needed to make to it, it never happened. It is called officially Orbital Vehicle 101 is its tail number. And that's important uh, as um, uh, as we have one of our Stay Curious watchers today. And I wrote down your uh, your name and, again, didn't carry it with me to, the, to here. One of you all pointed out the, uh, the names of the shuttles and their official tail number, all right? So Enterprise was actually OV-101, all right? Challenger, the second one built, was OV-99. It was a mock-up that was it was turned into a, a Challenger, uh, a real orbiter. But the first uh, shuttle was OV-102. And then Challenger's OV-199, OV-99, Enterprise's 101. 100 is kind of a pieces and parts that never did officially get built. And Pathfinder, a structural mock-up, was given 98. And then uh, Discovery was 103, Atlantis 104, and the replacement for Challenger is Endeavor with an O-U-R, the British spelling, and as OV-105. So it's fun to get to know those OV numbers and, and kind of commensurate with people like Terry White and uh, uh, other shuttle workers, the because that's how they they referred to them, not by name, but by the tail tail numbers there. And uh, it's a gentleman from uh, Jacksonville, 
uh, Kerry, I think, is your last name. He said he's been in the museum. Love the museum. Thank you for uh, turning me on to this, uh, uh, or turning everybody on to the OV numbers as we're talking about the shuttle enterprise. And one of the most important things that enterprise did, uh, again, one of the most traveled of all of the, certainly the most traveled of all the orbiters that never went to space because the ones that went to space quickly racked up millions of miles. But uh, go ahead and put our shuttle top, our, our, our stay curious on the top up there, Marty, if you would. Actually, I can do that right. No, yeah, right there, can I? Thank you. Um, the approach and landing tests uh, for in 1977 has uh, proved the aerodynamics of the shuttle. Uh, this, of course, was done by Fred Hayes, Gordon Fullerton, and the other team was Joe Engel and Richard Truly, and they took the this through the paces of the friendly skies on a shuttle carrier, uh, SCA, shuttle carrier aircraft, that's 747, it's called SCA. Uh, they would get it up and then release it. Uh, there were some questions whether it would hit the tail and all that stuff. The Enterprise was not built to hold the engines, so they would put dummies in there uh, to get the weight, but aerodynamically in the beginning, they covered up the engines. You see the speed, the nose rail out in front of it there. Uh, and uh, uh, quite a sight to see the five tests of the Endeavor, I mean, Enterprise, as it was so very important to learning about the gliding characteristics because once it was launched to space, it had to come back to Earth as a glider. There was no uh, power in those engines, no fuel for the three SSMEs, the uh, RCS engines and the Ohms pods weren't, weren't uh, didn't have enough fuel or powerful enough to... To, uh, had one shot at landing there, <coughs> and, our, and Marty's good friend Fred Hayes. Marty's dealt with Fred Hayes and the Grumman Group for many years as uh, piloting that with uh, Gordon Fullerton. And of course, the Enterprise rolled out at Palmdale manufacturing facilities with Star Trek cast members on September seventh, nineteen seventy-six. All right, I'm a little out of sequence here. Uh, time-wise. Uh, everybody from the uh, Star Trek showed up except Captain Kirk, okay? He did not show up. Uh, uh, William uh, Shatner. Shatner. Uh, I think he, I, I'm not sure what the problem was with that. Either he had something else to do, uh, but Shatner wasn't there, all right? But left to right there, is NASA Administrator James Fletcher. You got Bones there, DeForest Kelly, George Takai was Mr. Sulu, James Duhan was uh, Scotty, uh, the engineer, uh, Michelle Nichols is there, Lieutenant Uhuru, Leonard Nimoy, D D Mr. Spock, Gene Roddenberry is uh, there in the brown leisure suit there. After all, it is 1976. Of course, the creator, uh, as tall as Mr. Fletcher there. And a Democratic Congressman Don Fuqua was there. And then uh, uh, Chekhov, Walter Conning, the other actors there. Uh, quite a rollout. Where was Captain Kirk? Where was William Shatner, Marty? He must have been in space, all right, where no mug has gone before. And actually, this is my way to help promote... Uh, a great website, spaceweather.com. There is a group of high school kids called uh, uh, Calculus, uh, Earth to Sky Calculus. They do cosmic ray studies at this California high school and fly uh, almost every day a payload above the Sierra Nevada mountains. They take something up and bring it back to support the, the fuel that needs to go in that gas. You can own that for $170.10. Uh, so that's where I say Kirk was, uh, William Shatner, when all the Star Trek crew but him showed up at in at the uh, rollout of Enterprise. And that was a huge campaign to President Ford to get the name of this changed uh, from, uh, or considered the name to be changed from um, Constitution to 
Enterprise. So Enterprise was also used. Oh, we got that there. All, all kinds of things it was used for Enterprise was. That is not Enterprise. That's, that's a Pathfinder. Pathfinder, very crude model. Uh, built for fit checks also. Here is it at the mate de, de mate facility. Uh, unofficial orbiter designation 098. Uh, made of steel and wood. Constructed by NASA in 1977. Again, because they knew they would have to have models of the shuttle to fit check the different steps along the way of its integration and its uh, trip to space. Oh, get rid of Shatner there. Everywhere I say this, this uh, enterprise has been. There it is dangling in the air at Marshall Space Center where it was used again for a... Uh, a, 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 a fit check out there to t test the engines and so forth. Uh, there it is. Let's see if I had any special notes on that, and I don't. But there it is out at Marshall in Huntsville, Alabama. Love that picture of the whole complex out there. And then, Marty, they took it out to Palm to, to uh, California, to Vandenberg, and used it to clear off the roads as we were going to launch shuttles from Slick 6, the pad that was called uh, SLC uh, 6 out there. There you see it on a fit check. We were going to take Discovery out there. The Air Force was actually going to buy Discovery and do its uh, spy satellites in a polar orbit up there. Beautiful picture. Never did that. Never launched it. They actually had a crew chosen that never went to space. And a lot of people were glad of that. There was a, above my head are the two vents for the S, uh, SSMEs probably coming out of that, their flame, and then the, the two uh, solid rocket booster flame coming out of that, not off of different sides like we do on Kennedy Space Center. A lot of, lot of ifs up there, if that would have worked right or not. But nevertheless... Endeavor, I mean, Enterprise made it out there in a, for a, a fit check, uh, and that was a beautiful one of a time picture there. Enterprise ended up at the Udvar Hazy uh, Museum in Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. All right, and it stayed up there for, for uh, let me see if I can get the years involved that it was there. Um, No, I don't see that in my notes here. But there it is, and quite an elaborate display there at Udvar Hazy. All right. Uh, and uh, we they had a swap of them out there with Discovery and Endeavor. Uh, and then they were going to... So what were they going to do with... I mean, I keep saying Endeavor. Enterprise is on the left. And there's Discovery on the right. You can obviously see, see the patina on uh, OV103 Discovery uh, because it's been to space. Enterprise, of course, hasn't. And they put Enterprise. So this is a big deal out there. Uh, couldn't find the UCX photo out there. Maybe this is theirs, but uh, quite a swap out there. They even got a marching band and everything out there. And they put it on a, uh, the shuttle transport carrier and uh, sent it to its final resting place at the Intrepid Museum there down below uh, in the Hudson River. Uh, that's a cool picture of it there. As a tugboat tows the space shuttle Enterprise on a barge in the Hudson River to be displayed at the Intrepid Sea and Air Space Museum. This was June 6, 2012, so it's been there 11 years, all right? NASA's Bill Ingalls took that photo. Love to have Bill Ingalls on the program someday. Maybe we'll effort that. So, uh, and there she is resting in the Intrepid Museum there. I hope to get there. That's on my bucket list. I'll be seeing that on the way up to or the way back from the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, space flight up there in Long, uh, 
on Long Island, Marty. What am I thinking of? Help me there on a Avia uh, history of aviation, the Grumman Museum. Yeah. Uh, history of flight. What do they call that? I'm thinking. Uh, now nah, it's a Monday. We're in a little bit of a fog today. We just talked about it earlier today. Yeah. Uh, oh, but uh, anyway, bucket lists plenty for all of us space geeks out there. Enterprise went on public display in July 2012. Um, the uh, they had a temporary pressurized rubber fabric thing at the aft deck of the flight carrier, and uh, Hurricane Sandy caused a little problem to it, but they fixed it. Um, Enterprise is listed on the National Registry of Historic Places. All right, that's a good thing. Cradle of Aviation. Cradle, yeah, that's the word we were looking for, Marty. Cradle, Cradle of Aviation at Beth Page, New York, on Long Island. We will be seeing that. Marty and I got all kinds of road trips planned. We want to get out to the, see the uh, Cosmosphere and the fabulous Stafford Museum in Oklahoma. Uh, all kinds of places and summertime let's get out there and see it well pathfinder i mentioned pathfinder but there's a story of endeavor brought the full conclusion and a very important uh element of the shuttle history and we will probably feature the approach and landing tests at one shuttle fest in the very near future and devote a, devote a whole conference to that very fascinating well this is another mock-up all right this is pathfinder and this is Pathfinder's official home out at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, Pathfinder, again, built to uh, uh, be a fit check and, and help in determining how other infrastructure should be built. So, uh, and the, uh, there's another one, Marty, called Inspiration. Now, there's two Inspirations. Inspiration is the shuttle that's out at the shuttle runway, all right? And I'll have to dig up a picture of that. It actually has a regular door on it, not a hatch. It's got like a, a regular house door on the side of it. And it was kind of used for a family day. And I believe uh, kind of to go get inside of it. And I believe it was used for fire and rescue also. That's inspiration. There's an inspiration that was built in Downey, California. And they were going to, they actually spent millions of dollars to restore it and bring it uh, to show it. But uh, it's been uh, housed and not, not been shown for a while. And I find it also interesting that um, uh, Enterprise was also hidden from view for uh about eight years, 18 years, from 1985 to 2003, it was stored at Smithsonian's hangar in Washington Dulles International Airport before it was restored and moved to the Udvar Hazy. So it was actually mothballed for almost two decades before it uh, saw light again in public eyes in there. So, well, thank you, Marty. Anybody have any comments about Enterprise? Wanted to talk just a little bit about some of the future ahead of us here and and uh, kind of reinforce people's minds that this is the SpaceX Starship is contracted for NASA's moon landing. There is uh, the Grumman Lunar Module that Marty worked on 52 year, years ago or more in relation to, that's 23 feet high, your lunar module there and over 200 feet high, the Starship. So you got to have a long rope to get down to the surface, Marty. And here is the different configurations. There's one on the left of the the gateway, all right, going uh, orbit in the moon with two starship configurations around it. So it's actually bigger than the gateway, uh, not not uh, uh, where, where humans can be because most of that starship is fuel. But there's another concept of it uh, attached to the gateway. Yeah, question, Marty, or comment. Yeah, probably both. Uh, anyway, uh, Carlton Bailey mentioned that the engine covers were used uh, to ferry the shuttle back on top of the 747. So anyway, it's just a comment. And um, thank you. Oh, and Dave Stang is asking, was Pathfinder the shuttle that was at the Kennedy Visitor Center at one time? Uh, Good question there. 
I, I'm not going to say yes or no. Okay. So, um, there's also, uh, uh, one at uh, Houston on top of the, uh, shuttle carrier aircraft. So I'll, I'll research into, into that, that and then dig a little bit more. Main thing was that in this date in history, uh, 40, what, uh, uh, three years ago is when we first saw the shuttle at Kennedy Space Center. Yes. Yeah, Carlton Bailey said there was one on display as a walkthrough exhibit at the visitor center named Ambassador. All right. I don't remember that. Thanks, Carlton. Well, that inspires me to look up all these uh, ones made of wood and metal that weren't designed to fly. But, yeah, I remember the one at Kennedy Visitor's Complex very thoroughly. You could get up in it and look into the cockpit through glass. Uh, so, uh, uh, but thank you all for your interest in that. Uh, and I'll prepare a little bit better uh, as this today's show uh, evolved. I got more and more into all those shuttles and we'll talk about them more. Uh, thank you for some great ideas there. There's the shuttle. Uh, again, we want to emphasize what's going to the moon. Uh, and there's another look at Starship. Two of them attached to the gateway. All right. You can either, a couple ways you can do this. And Marty, as I've been looking into this, you also have the, um, um, this is one illustration I found from SpaceX showing how they might uh, leave one on the surface. I don't know how anyone's going to get back. Okay. I guess they're not, but they can, they're thinking about with a crane setting one down on its side and it could become a habitat. All right, that people could live in. So uh, you wouldn't, don't want to waste anything that large that goes to the moon, uh, particularly when it can become a habitat. So, well, I am grateful for everybody watching Stay Curious today, kicking off our episode number 791 with Marty and I. Uh, of course, we're going to be talking a lot about Shuttle Fest here uh, this week. Uh, we'll uh, talk some more in detail about Shuttle Fest tomorrow. Uh, some astronomy we've got going. Wednesday, we're going to have Terry White talk about shuttles of May, I mean, April. Thursday, Tom Usiak's going to be in town and talk about his experience at the Bachnor Kazak Drome launch in Norm Thagard to the Mir Space Station in 1995. And Friday, of course, the event uh, before, uh, day before Shuttle Fest, we're going to have Chris Callie here talking about his art. And Mike Cotton talking about the documentary, The Bridge to Space. So thank you for watching. Doug Forrest, Carlton Bailey, Gary Gerald, Steve Hammer, Humberto Lopez is watching. Robert Law is up there in Dundee, Scotland. Dave Stangy, thank you for shouting out. Hazel Banks, I enjoyed talking to Hayes today. The Astronaut Files is watching. Kiki Z is watching. Yeah, Kiki Badass is what she is, our... Trekkie Techie, Cynthia Rossi is watching. Petronio Bellasi, thank you. That's a new name up there. Christopher Mick and Daniel DeYoung. Don't know if Daniel's going to make it to town or not for Shuttle Fest. Larry Pushkar. And, and uh, Larry Pushkar is watching. And uh, they, if they're not going to be at Shuttle Fest, they can watch it stream live. Uh, Marty will be doing that with uh, uh, our... Trekkie Techie up there. Yes, a question, Marty. Yeah, I have the question, Mark. On that uh, image you have there, if that becomes a habitat, then how do they live, lift off the moon and head back to uh, Gateway? Yeah, I mentioned that. If that's going to be a habitat, who's where's the spaceship to get them home? But, pro you know, he says he can bring 30 or 40 people in that. So if they land four or five and then land another one, I don't know how it's going to work. Uh, Marty, uh, they're... Artemis 2 will probably be scheduled around November 2024, 18 months from now. So hold your breath. Let's hope we get there. Uh, I've been praying for every political administration, Republican, Democrat, whatever, for the last 50 years that somebody endorsed the money to expand humanity's horizons to the moon. Look at what Apollo did 50 years ago. Look what the shuttle's done to uh, build society and, and close in communications uh, in such an incredible way and change our lives. So good point there, Marty. Well, let's get everybody thinking optimistic this week. Let's take you out with a 
Nicole Stott Stottism of the week, go slow to go fast. And my good friend and earthling astronaut there, Nicole Stott, that's what I'm going to be thinking of, going slow to go fast. So I accomplished things in a very busy week this week, Marty, as we're going to enjoy seeing these three guys uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, Terry White, thank you for your support of Stay Curious as I go to here. Uh, he'll be talking tomorrow on uh, uh, shuttles, uh, the Shuttle Garage. I know Bill Whiting's going to enjoy that. He's watching today. Jonathan Ward, thank you for watching today. He knows Mikey Haddad there. He's going to talk about Shuttles of April. Uh, he is our uh, wrote a book on the payloads. Mikey Haddad did. Level 4 is where he worked in the space shuttle processing facility and monday may 1st we're going to have nick thomas on here talking about the great alan shepherd with some first-hand stories and ones that next heard is the astronaut wrangler at kennedy space center visitors complex he is north or delaware norse uh, uh astronaut encounter educator out there nick we're so glad to have him on board and nick's going to be our master of ceremonies when he's not on that panel at Shuttlefest Saturday. So thank you, everybody, for staying tuned to Shuttlefest. Oh, beat, beat me to it. I beat you to it there, Marty. The Manhattan skyline, hard to believe. I lived there about three years in the in 1980s. I survived it and got out of it, though. But uh, there's some skyscrapers with millions of people. I wonder if any of them are staying curious. But anyway, we're glad that you are. Hope that you can plan a vacation at our fabulous museum here in downtown Titusville. And uh, Marty, anything else we need to share with our friends today? Nope, I think we're good. All right. Well, we got a big week planned and glad that you're with us. Again, we've got Terry White on Wednesday, Tom uh, Usiak on Thursday, Chris Kelly with uh, artist Chris Kelly with the documentary maker Mike Cotton on Friday. So until then, I'm Mark Marquez saying I can't wait to see you again to bridge the space between us.